Welcome everyone, my name is Kimberly Doris and I'm the Executive Director and CEO of the Graves Disease and Thyroid Foundation. Today's webinar, which was pre-recorded on February 17th, 2021, is on neuropsychiatric complaints in Graves disease. When we say neuropsychiatric, we are not talking about issues that are all in your head, far from it. These are real issues that affect, for example, mood, sleep, memory, and concentration, and they have a real impact on your quality of life. But these issues are more challenging for your doctor to measure and monitor than, for example, how many times your heart beats per minute, or how many millimeters of bulging each, you, uh, each of your eyes has. Uh, they can also sometimes linger even after your thyroid dysfunction has been corrected. I wish I could say that we're going to solve this puzzle today, but our goal is more to shine a light on how these issues affect quality of life for our patient community. Our program today was made possible with the grants from the County of San Diego Community Enhancement Program, and our format will be a combination of moderated discussion, presentations, and Q&A. The first presenter you'll hear from is Madison McInnes, who will be providing some background information on Graves disease. Madison is currently a research associate at the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition in Pensacola, Florida, where she works towards developing mitigation strategies for cognitive and environmental stressors in extreme military environments. She graduated from the University of West Florida in 2018 with a degree in communications, and she returned to University of West Florida to complete a post-baccalaureate program in biomedical sciences. While currently working as a research associate, she is also in the process of applying to medical school. Next, Dr. James Aruda will highlight two surveys done 20 years apart that captured the patient experience with neuropsychiatric complaints. Dr. Aruda is a professor of psychology at University of West Florida, teaching courses in cognitive neuroscience, biological psychology, sensation and perception, research methods, and behavioral statistics. He is a research neuropsychologist whose research focuses on brain behavior relationships in Alzheimer's dementia, mild cognitive impairment, and sustained human performance. For the past several years, he has been developing a biomarker for Alzheimer's dementia. Our final presentation, before we take some of your questions, which were submitted via a survey distributed prior to recording, will be from Dr. Nancy Hord Patterson. Dr. Patterson is an advanced registered nurse practitioner and has spent 43 years working in psychology and mental health. She earned a bachelor's and a master's degree in psychology from the University of North Florida and earned a doctorate in counselor education at the University of Florida. In 1990, she founded the National Graves Disease Foundation, now known as the Graves Disease and Thyroid Foundation, and serves on the GDATF's board of directors as chair emeritus. She has been either a large member or an officer of the Thyroid Federation International since its inception in 1995 and is a past recipient of the American Thyroid Association's Pioneer in Patient Education Award. As I mentioned, our program today is centered around two patient surveys that were done 20 years apart on neuropsychiatric complaints in Graves' disease. The first survey was conducted in the mid-1990s and the results were published in the spring 1996 issue of the Journal of Neuropsych Neuropsychiatry and Clinical Neurosciences under the title, A Survey Study of Neuropsychiatric Complaints in Patients with Graves' Disease by Stern et al. Uh, Dr. Patterson, can you tell us uh, a little bit about how the foundation, which at the time was just a few years old, uh, got involved with the initial survey? Yes, I can. Um, like you say, we were a very young foundation at that point, and I was attending an American Psychiatric Association just meeting we were exhibiting. <clears throat> and I was apparently reading something and this gentleman named Dr. Robert Stern stopped by and he said, um, you need to know, I, because I guess the topic was, do things get better? And he said, you need to know that frequently they do not get completely better, not that they don't get better. And of course that was, you know, my big hope was that things were just going to get all back to normal. And <clears throat> I met Dr. Arthur Frank, who very shortly became one of our board members, but they wanted to do this survey that was done in 96, I believe. And I said, well, we, we don't have any way to help you financially, which I'm sure you need, but we can help you get subjects because we have members all over the country. So you're not just getting them. Um, at the time, Dr. Prang was in North Carolina 
I think Dr. St anyway, it was, you know, we could give you a more national spread and they were very receptive to that and other people joined in it as well, but that was how we got involved. Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Patterson. Dr. Aruda, you were a postdoctoral student working with Dr. Stern um, while this was going on and you were credited as an author in the original publication. Um, do you have any background to add regarding the original survey? Well, I was fortunate enough to be a postdoctoral research fellow at Brown University and I was working with Dr. Robert Stern when he was working on this particular project. And I was brought in to assist with some of the data analyses and the interpretation uh, that we uh, obtained from the data from this particular sample. Uh, and so it was a real pleasure to work with him on this particular project. And it was also really enlightening for me at the time uh, as somebody with, uh, you know, recently uh, uh, acquiring a PhD, uh, doing some clinical uh, uh, research and, and seeing what some of the symptoms could be like associated with Graves' disease, it, it was really enlightening. It was a great opportunity for me. Such a great opportunity, in fact, we'll be talking about the second study in, in just a moment. Okay, and that's a good um, segue into what made you decide to revisit this project 20 years later, and what was that process like? Well, um, I had a graduate student, uh, Diane Freilitz, uh, who... Uh, suffered from uh, Graves' disease, and she was interested in a uh, project for her master's thesis. And one of the first things that came to mind was this, was this study that we had done back in 1996, and of course, it had been many years since then. But I thought, how neat would it be to obtain the actual questions from the original survey and then administer it, not on paper and, and, and you know, with with paper and pencil, but electronically, because it was so many years later, to see if anything has changed uh, within the patient membership of the Graves Disease and Thyroid Foundation. And so that was really the impetus of the study. And of course, uh, as you know, it was, it was very successful in terms of participation. And we'll be talking about those findings in a little bit, but it was a great experience also for Diane Freilix, uh, who ultimately did earn her uh, master's degree, but was also able to learn a little bit more, not only about the psychiatric symptoms, but also about the prevalence of treatment and, and what seemed to work and what didn't. Okay, thank you. And before we dive into Dr. Aruda's findings, uh, we'll invite Madison McKinnis to provide some background information that will help us all better understand Graves' disease. Okay, so first we're going to be talking a little bit about what is Graves' disease. So it is an autoimmune disorder that is a leading cause of hyperthyroidism in the United States. And what hyperthyroidism is, um, it occurs when the thyroid gland, which is located in the neck below the voice box, makes too much thyroid hormone. And so this excess thyroid hormone is released due to a malfunctioning immune system. Um, and this releases antibodies that are able to bind to the thyroid cells in the thyroid gland. And so when these antibodies bind to the thyroid cells, they mimic the function of thyroid stimulating hormone. And this is TSH. And the way that it mimics the effects of TSH is that it's able to trigger the release of the thyroid hormones T3 and T4. And these are known as triiodothyronine and tetraiodothyronine respectively. And then in addition, you can see the prevalence of hyperthyroidism and grave disease. It occurs in about 20 to 50 individuals per 100,000 that are affected annually. And it is approximately 1% of the population that's afflicted. Additionally, studies have shown that Graves' disease is more common in women than men, and it can occur in any age, but it's most often seen in middle age, between 30 to 50 years old. Okay, so within Graves' disease, there are two classes of symptoms that have been shown, um, and thyroid hormones you know, play a large role in metabolism and growth, development, body temperature, and mood regulation. So because these hormones have such a large effect within the body, when the thyroid is malfunctioning, a wide range of symptoms can present in the patients and then be thus divided into the somatic and neuropsychiatric categories. So somatic 
somatic, uh, sorry. So somatic symptoms include physical manifestations, and these can include goiter, which is enlargement of the thyroid gland, and then ophthalmopathy, which is presenting as increased uh, bulging of the eyes and then retracted eyelids. And then you see the swelling and redness in the white part of the eye as well, as well as dry eyes and a gritty feeling within the eyes. Additionally, other somatic manifestations can include atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular and rapid heart rate, dermopathy, which is red swollen skin. And this is usually seen in the shins and the tops of the feet. And then also acropathy is associated with dermopathy. And this is tissue swelling in the hands and clubbing of the fingers. And then the other class of symptoms that we see with Graves' disease are neuropsychiatric. And these neuropsychiatric symptoms were revealed in the study by Stern and colleagues in 1996. And what these symptoms include are those that involve the mind and the nervous system. And so this could include things like irritability, anxiety, sadness, impaired cognitive abilities, shakiness, weight loss, inability to sleep, excess crying, and loss of pleasure. And so in the study by Stern and colleagues, they looked into a little bit of some of the diagnosis complications seen in patients with Graves' disease. Um, so Stern and colleagues found that 35% of patients had to wait six months or longer uh, to seek treatment. And then once they did seek treatment, 35% of these patients reported that it took three months or longer to receive an accurate diagnosis of Graves' disease. And that time to receive an accurate diagnosis arose from the fact that with the neuropsychiatric symptoms, a lot of the primary care physicians were actually misdiagnosing Gray's disease as a mood disorder um, and as a psychiatric issue in patients. And so they were actually prescribing psychotropic medications to them um, instead of addressing the Graves' disease. And then here we have a list of references um, in which the prevalence rates and some of this background information regarding Graves' disease was, pull was pulled from in peer-reviewed journals. And with that, I will pass it over to Dr. Aruda, who will present the current investigation. So as I mentioned previously, um, we were really interested in looking at the prevalence of neuropsychiatric symptoms uh, 20 years later after the original study that I was involved in with Dr. Robert Stern when I was at Brown University there uh, in the Department of Psychiatry, uh, because we thought it would be interesting to know whether or not things have changed. Uh, a lot of things within society has changed. For example, technology and the use of technology has changed. Of course, there's been greater awareness uh, since that time, that many years back. And so we were really interested in knowing whether or not in the patient population uh, of those who are members of the Graves Disease and Thyroid Foundation as to whether or not things have changed, whether or not things have gotten better. And so to do this, what we did was we found the original uh, survey uh, with its questions, but had to adapt it to a survey software platform so that we could administer it more efficiently uh, to the patient um, membership of the Graves Disease and Thyroid Foundation. And let me just get my uh, laser pointer up here. And again, we, we were very interested in knowing whether or not um, neuropsychiatric symptoms were still some of the main features. And if so, what were those neuropsychiatric symptoms? And we also wanted to know if the patient uh, membership had changed uh, in terms of demographic characteristics. And so what we decided to do is we decided to use some of the same measures, but also add some measures uh, to our particular questionnaire. So we decided to keep, for example, in addition to the demographic questions that Stern and colleagues used in the original survey in 1996, we also included things like time to seek treatment, which basically is a measure of time 
or how much time it took from the first presentation of a symptom to actually being motivated to go and seek treatment for it, diagnose and treatment for it. Um, and then what we also decided to do was to uh, keep the time to diagnosis measure, which was also in the original investigation. And of course, what this means is that once seeking treatment, how long did it take to actually um, receive an appropriate diagnosis? We also included sy symptom prevalence. This was something that was in the original survey also, which is basically a list of symptoms. And we had participants order them um, in the order that they thought they were most important or experienced most often. But we went beyond uh, those three measures that were in the original study. We actually added two. We added misdiagnosis and we also um, added treatment prevalence because we were interested in knowing based upon that previous investigation, uh, not only how things are currently, but we wanted to know a little bit more about the, about the misdiagnoses that may have occurred. Um, and also we wanted to know a little bit about what the current treatments were and what patients thought uh, the treatments in terms of their efficacy, how well they did uh, we wanted to know what patients felt about that. And so in this particular study, uh, we had 1,603 participants, and this was uh, quite a breakthrough uh, because the original survey had about 137 participants. And of course, that was a paper and pencil uh, test, and this was an electronic survey that was given. The mean age was about 47 years old, and there were many more females than males in this particular sample, but that was very consistent with what Stern had found. And in fact, it's consistent with this particular uh, endocrine disorder where females are affected much more than males. Uh, and this is also uh, associated with autoimmune disorders uh, because that's what um, Graves' disease uh, really is. And 88% of the participants in this particular study, and of course, these were uh, patient members of the Graves Disease and Thyroid Foundation, 88% were Caucasian. So one of the things we looked at first were the demographic characteristics, uh, much like Stern did. So we were able to kind of compare, for example, uh, the percentage of males and females the marital status, the educational attainment, as well as the employment status and the income level of our participants so that we could compare it with the same characteristics that Stern had looked at 20 years before. And what we found was that the frequencies or the percentage of males and females was the same, but in our sample, people tended to be more likely to be married uh, their educational attainment was higher than it was 20 years previously. They were more likely to be employed outside the home. Uh, and the income, even when corrected for inflation, was about $5,000 higher than it was uh, 20 years previous. And here you can see in the table all of these characteristics that we looked at, not just in the Stern study, but in the current investigation, and you can see the percentage of females in the original and the percentage of females um, in the current investigation. And you can see that there's a very close relationship uh, in the numbers of females and males in both uh, samples, although the current sample was so much larger. We did look at marital status, as I've mentioned, and, and I described that there were more married people in this particular sample uh, than in the previous sample. And you can see, the change in the numbers or frequencies uh, of individuals who endorse these different categories uh, from 20 years ago to pretty much now. And of course, as I mentioned, uh, marriage was uh, a higher probability. People endorse that as being uh, more likely here in this current sample. And then of course we looked at employment status and what you can see is that people there's a, a slight uptick in the percentage of people who are working part-time, maybe a little less from uh, in, in uh, part-time, but full-time uh, working a little bit more. 
And you can see that working within the home uh, was a little bit more prevalent back then. So there's been a shift in working outside versus inside. And there's also been a slight change or decline in disability and even, uh, well, an increase in unemployment. So there were some changes in employment status uh, between the first sample and the second. And then the other finding we had was income level where income you can see uh, going from kind of lower uh, um, salaries to higher salaries that there was an increased percentage of people making the higher salaries compared to what they were 20 years previous. And of course, here we have the educational attainment, again, going from the lower educational attainment to the higher. And you can see, much like with uh, income, uh, you can see a shift down towards the higher degrees with the current uh, sample. So in addition to looking at the demographic characteristics, we also took a look at one of the other very important outcome measures that Stern had looked at, time to seek treatment. And uh, what we found was that 15% of individuals, about 21 people of the 137 that they uh, surveyed, reported that they were seeking treatment well within one month of experiencing symptoms. But in the current sample, um, what we found was that only 8%, about half the number of people were actually seeking treatment within the first month. And that many, many more people were taking six months or more to seek treatment. So instead of, instead of seeing what we had expected to see, which was perhaps a greater number than 15% uh, um, seeking treatment within a month's period of time, we saw a decline and we basically saw um, just a, a larger increase in the incidence of individuals seeking treatment uh, many months uh, beyond uh, when they're first experiencing symptoms. So that was a big change and it was also significant. We also looked at time to diagnosis, which was that other measure that was included by Stern and colleagues. And uh, for the previous investigation, in that sample of 237 individuals, 41 or 30% uh, responded that they received an accurate diagnosis within one week of seeking treatment. That stands in real in, in great contrast to what we found, which is 16% were able to receive an accurate diagnosis within one week. And of course, you can see those frequencies here, less than one week, about 30%. That went down to 16% in the current sample. And you can see that the further out we go, the greater the percentage of people uh, who endorsed that particular timeline, indicating that it took them longer to actually uh, get an appropriate uh, diagnosis of Graves' disease once they did seek treatment. And that was statistically significant also. And then we looked at symptom endorsement. And I found this to be particularly interesting because what we were trying to do here is we were trying to pose a number of symptom characteristics to the people that we were studying, but they had also done this in the Stern study uh, 20 years ago. And the purpose of this is to have individuals endorse those symptoms that we presented to them. And based upon the endorsement of those symptoms, we ordinarily position them uh, based upon how often they were endorsed. And so what you see here is the percentage of endorsement for those symptoms that we provided a description of to the participants in the Stern study, but we also have the percentage of individuals who endorsed those same symptoms 20 years later. And one of the fascinating things for me about this finding was that the order of symptoms based on endorsement held up across the 20 years. Which, which really speaks to the validity of these findings and these symptoms, that 20 years later, 
the individuals who did not take the first study, these are in new individuals, are still saying that they're having the same symptoms and they're endorsing them or experiencing them uh, in the same rate as they did 20 years previous. The only difference that we found was that the order was the same, but the degree of endorsement, meaning the numbers of people endorsing them, not the order, increased. So you, you had pretty much the same ordinal position of symptoms, prevalence of symptoms, but many more people were uh, endorsing or saying basically that they were experiencing these you know, top 10 symptoms. One of the things we did that was not included in the original study conducted by Stern and colleagues was we actually looked at misdiagnoses. And we were interested in knowing um, whether or not people were misdiagnosed and if, they, and if they were, what percentage of people were misdiagnosed? And based upon our study, about 683 people, which was about 43% of the sample, reported receiving a, uh, a, a uh, inappropriate diagnosis or being misdiagnosed. And we weren't satisfied with that. We knew that not only did we need to know whether or not people were misdiagnosed, but we're, what were some of the common, common misdiagnoses that were given? And what we found based upon the endorsement of, uh, and we actually asked people in the survey to write in what the actual diagnoses were. And then we went through to try to, um, you know, organize what the responses were. And what we found was generalized anxiety as well as depression and panic disorder, mood disorders were some of the most common mis misdiagnoses that participants experienced if they were misdiagnosed, uh, which makes a lot of sense given the symptom prevalence uh, that you saw, given the impotence for this study based upon the findings of the first study, which were that there were neuropsychiatric symptoms associated with Graves disease that can actually result in misdiagnosis. And so we have uh, some data here to suggest that in fact that happened to at least uh, 43% of the individuals. Uh, we were interested not in just misdiagnosis, what the common misdiagnoses were, but we were also interested in knowing if there were some sort of risk factors, if you will, for misdiagnosis. And what we found was education level, employment status, and also time to seek treatment seemed to be related to misdiagnoses. And so if somebody had a lower uh, education level, for example, they were more likely to receive a misdiagnosis. If somebody were um, not employed outside the home or, or uh, maybe employed within the home or maybe not employed at all due to disability, for example, they were more likely to be misdiagnosed. And also time to seek treatment. I thought this was kind of interesting. The longer it took somebody uh, to uh, seek treatment, the, the harder it was to get an appropriate diagnosis. And in addition to adding the previous questions, we also looked at treatment. We wanted to know what were the common treatments uh, uh, being uh, given uh, 20 years later. And of course, we found some of, some of the treatments that we would have expected. For example, antithyroid medications came out as number one in terms of the uh, treatment being prescribed for somebody with Graves' disease. But we also found radioactive iodine still, although it was about half the prevalence. And then there were holistic uh, methods as well as surgery. And we went beyond just asking what the treatments were that people were receiving. We also asked them what, how effective they thought they were, because in some cases, some of these individuals experienced more than one treatment. And it was very clear to us that not only are more people being treated with antithyroid drugs, uh, individuals would report that those antithyroid drugs were probably the best at relieving some of their symptoms um, with radioactive iodine uh, coming second. 
Uh, beta blockers are here. We had put them up in the survey, but of course, beta blockers, uh, which are these um, medications uh, that are sometimes prescribed for anxiety, are meant to kind of tamp down the sympathetic response uh, and the periphery of the body. And because uh, somebody on a beta blocker, these are basically blood pressure medications, uh, but, you know, people who are on beta blockers typically don't have that sort of peripheral experience of anxiety, which, which is good because it, it reduces the sort of uh, reverberation or the cycling, if you will, of anxiety that can, that can occur centrally versus uh, peripherally. And in the end, based upon all the findings uh, that we had, uh, we really had to conclude that in fact, people are still presenting with many of the same neuropsychiatric symptoms and that they continue to have some of the same problems in terms of uh, not only seeking treatment, but also getting an appropriate diagnosis in time. And this does make sense to me, given that some of the symptoms can be produced by other sorts of um, other sorts of disorders. Uh, for example, if somebody has or presents with uh, in generalized anxiety, it, it's entirely possible without knowing much more, certainly about uh, the thyroid levels, it, it's hard to know whether or not it's due to um, generalized anxiety in, in areas of the brain such as the amygdala or, or whether or not it's due to the thyroid uh, function. Uh, and the release of thyroid hormones within the body, increasing the metabolism. And so um, we were a bit surprised by our findings and be primarily because we thought that with time, uh, with the tremendous efforts of the Graves Disease and Thyroid Foundation, but also with the amount of information that people can readily gain on just about any topic that, um, that many of these measures that we looked at would have improved. For example, we expected uh, time to seek treatment, perhaps improving because with those symptoms, people could actually get online and gain some valuable information about Graves' disease related to it uh, with the search that they might do. Uh, we also thought that, um, you know, with the technology and the access to information and the outreach for example, by groups like the uh, Graves Disease and Thyroid Foundation, we, we thought that um, uh, not just patients, but also clinicians might be more in tune to some of these symptoms, might be kind of a tip off, if you will, for perhaps abnormal levels of um, T4 thyroid hormones. So, so those were some of our conclusions. Now, the strength of this particular study, and we're gonna be talking a little bit more about that, but the strength of it really came from the strength of the original study because the design was exactly the same and the items comprising the questionnaire were exactly the same. And so we used a cross-sectional design, which means that we studied uh, groups of people at one time point um, and we used the same questionnaire and our sample size was, was very, very large uh, as sample sizes go for um, populations of people. Um, there are other strengths here that I didn't list, but let me mention that some of the findings we had coincided very nicely with the findings of the study done previously, which is a measure of the validity of the findings using the same scales. So some of the limitations associated with the study are the same limitations that were there for the first study, which is this is a purely correlational study, uh, meaning that we measure characteristics in people um, who participate in the study, and we look at associations between those characteristics. So for example, we, we looked at educational attainment, and we looked at that characteristic of educational attainment and how it related to uh, the self-reported uh, information that we obtained. So it's purely correlational. Another limitation that I didn't put down here, but probably should have, was that there was a self-selected nature um, to this particular study, meaning that 
uh, we were studying patient members of the Graves Disease and Thyroid Foundation. Well, that's a self-selected group. Not everyone who has Graves Disease belongs to the Graves Disease and Thyroid Foundation. So we're, we're probably looking at people who may have a more severe form of the disorder in terms of uh, symptoms uh, and or they may be more um, uh, dedicated to finding answers than perhaps others who are not patient members of the Graves Disease and Thyroid Foundation. So in addition to the correlational findings that we, that we had, the people we were studying may not generalize to the general population of individuals with Graves' disease. With that said, there's nothing different about this study from the previous study with the exception of the additional questions at the end, but also the much larger sample size. Thank you, Dr. Aruda. Um, there are, um, that was fascinating and there are so many individual threads that you could pull on um, within just that short um, presentation that you did. Um, now the results of the original survey appeared in a peer-reviewed publication, um, but you made the decision to publish these updated results as a Kindle ebook. And so just to side note that um, this program is being aired on YouTube. And if you look in the description of the video, we will include a link so that people can find that ebook. Um, so what went into your decision to publish in this um, kind of unusual format? Well, the ebook was the result of not only myself, but my colleagues, the co-authors, thinking about the best way of disseminating the information. We, we had wanted to publish it in the original journal that Stern and colleagues published their uh, paper in, um, uh, but we submitted it and, it and it was not reviewed. It was just, we were told that it wasn't appropriate for the journal. We got that same sort of uh, message across a number of different journals, which really surprised me given the success of the, of the first article, which has been, which has been highly, highly cited and, uh, and a follow-up would have been a, a fantastic thing to publish in, in that way. But I, I, think, I think what was happening was the, the, the editors were looking at the correlational nature of it. And it is quite possible that because this isn't the first study to use such correlational methods, looking at neuropsychiatric symptoms with graves, that it was a little, little less desirable to, to publish. In any case, there was some resistance to publishing it for those reasons. And the only way to get this information out would, would be in the form that uh, you just described, this, this sort of ebook that would be available to everyone, not just within the country, but also um, in other countries. Um, and so that's why we chose to kind of publish the findings in that way. Okay, thank you, Dr. Aruda. So Dr. Patterson, I'll turn to you. Um, so obviously this wasn't a prospective double-blinded randomized trial, which is considered the gold standard of research. Um, Dr. Aruda talked about some of the limitations, including that this was a, a self-selected um, population. Um, but even given those limitations, can you talk about the relevance of this type of research for our overall patient community? Yes. One thing I want to mention up front is typically the type of patients that become involved with the Graves Foundation are what Dr. Carol Greenlee referred to one time as fourth standard deviation patients, meaning there's the whole bell-shaped curve, but the, the fourth standard deviation is about, Dr. Ruda might know, but it might just be one or two percent of the whole population. We're the ones that are very challenging to doctors with Graves. And, and there's many, many people that Graves is just no big deal. And that's wonderful for them, but very difficult for the, for the, for the difficult patients. And one of the reasons it makes it hard to find a good doctor that knows about this little bit of people. I used to, I used to post on the internet that people that were doing fine with great disease weren't on there going, Oh, by the way, everybody, I'm doing great. You know, it was the ones that were having problems. And 
I think the study, I don't think you can do a, a double blind randomized, there's one more word study with something like this. They're just, there's not, you know, you couldn't find the, the one percenters on the other end of the spectrum, for instance. I think it's very valid with what it says. And what's very interesting is things haven't changed very much in 20 years. I think that people with Graves' disease, the, the more difficult kind, particularly in America, we tend to rationalize things and we go, oh, it's for stress. And, you know, we don't take it seriously until it's practically knocked us down. And then when we get to the doctor, what we talk about are these things like anxiety and inappropriate behavior and that. So the doctors didn't necessarily learn about that in medical school, learned the basics of grades, that it's an elevated TSH. And when you do a com complete blood work, thyroid is not included. You have to go over to the other side of the lab page and check off thyroid pro profile. And so we make it difficult to diagnose. The doctors have a difficult diagnosing it because it is a rare disorder. They don't see it that often. And it just, it's kind of a self-perpetuating funnel that goes down. Okay, thank you, Dr. Patterson. I'll turn the program over to you now um, to provide a little more insight about the patient experience. Okay, this is just something I copied off the internet. And I don't think it lists any emotional psychiatric symptoms at all. And that's just, they're not there. But those, those are the physical manifestations of Graves' disease. So you go to the next slide. This is a shorter symptom list. And it, at least it, it mentions emotional and psychological things. But it, it doesn't say that they're really, really important. So again, we're, we're faced with, with situations where these are the things that, that doctors look at overall. And what we're usually complaining about is that bottom one. And they're both valid and it's, it's, simply, it's simply not something that say a, a regular endocrinologist has much training in at all. They have training in, in diabetes, they have training in you know, all, all the other endocrine systems and, and thyroid is just a little tiny part. So you, you have to try to look for thyroidologists who specialize in thyroid disease and they get it almost immediately. That's the end of that one. Okay. Um, I'm having a hard time seeing my, my, my slides. The quality of life for Graves' disease has practically all of these things that are on this list. We're exhausted. We're having trouble concentrating. We're having, we're worried about keeping our jobs because we're making mistakes. And there are, significant relationship problems with many people. Um, we, and we don't know. I think that's one of the biggest, the biggest things that, that worries all of us. The thing I want people to take away from this is these are not personal failures. And being a person that's very involved in mental health, I think all of us know that, that mental health is still very stigmatized. And so if, if somebody says, man, I just can't remember anything. It's like, oh, you're, you know, it, it's your fault. And it's sometimes very hard to make people understand that 
this is very, very real. It's not personal failure. It's not your fault. Because we all go, why did I get this? And there is no answer to that. You know, you didn't do anything to make it happen. And, and that's, and the other thing that's not on here is usually, unless it's later in the disease, when we have a goiter and have bulging eyes and have the skin disorders, which are known as Graves' disease triad, but we don't walk into the doctor's office with that. We look pretty normal. And people, you go, I don't know what your problem is, just get over it. And trust me, if we could, we would. So there's that lack of communication, lack of understanding between us and other people in our lives. Next slide. I don't, I know we're talking about Graves' disease, but so many, many people in this fourth standard deviation group also have thyroid eye disease, which is a separate disorder, but they happen almost always at the same time. And these are the things that have been identified by patients as the most disabling, the most ruining of quality of life. One is double vision, one is you know, you look bug-eyed, you look like Marty Feldman's sister. It's, some people can't drive anymore because they can't see well. They walk outside and the light blinds them. They can't do their hobbies if their hobby was like little tiny cross-stitching. They can't see it, they can't read. You get, not only do you have feelings of isolation, you are isolated because you can't go do the things you used to do and people get tired of coming to get you to do them. And so there's this, this sense of isolation that's extremely real and extremely inf influencing your quality of life. And again, you, you usually look pretty good. And so people, people don't understand it and you get tired of talking about it which is one reason we try to have support groups so that you can be with people who are experiencing the same things and go, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. So you get some validation and then you don't need it as much from everybody else in your life. Next slide. <clears throat> okay. Patients there's differences in patients and families and caregivers. Patients experience all their physical and emotional symptoms. Families experience mostly the emotional symptoms, frequently in a, in a negative atmosphere. And that gets to that, you know, is, is things like the, the relationship challenges and the, the graves rage. And, and that, that's usually going on when, you're, when your levels are totally out of whack. Physicians experience the confusion with proper diagnosis and follow-up and the, the complicating physical emotional symptoms, as well as the fact that each patient is different. The medical system <clears throat> now very much limits the time that a, a doctor gets to spend with their patient. And we, we as patients, limited a great deal by saying, you know, doctor, I just feel terrible. Well, that doesn't really help them very much. <laughs> I think it's the next slide that goes into this. <clears throat> okay, what we need, we need a, a, a physician that is experienced in treating Graves' disease. So we get to the thyroidologist person. We need a doctor who will take and perhaps have the time to really listen. If you're talking to someone who has his back to you because they're typing on the computer, that's not really listening. You need a doctor that sees you as a whole person in context, as opposed to patient with the diagnosis of Graves' disease. <clears throat> okay. 
you need a doctor that will involve you in the treatment process and choices. You need a team. It's usually not just one doctor doing things. You need some, the patients need support, <clears throat> excuse me, support. They need individual support. They need family involvement. They need to know that they're not alone. They need to understand that doctors have to be concerned with a whole bunch of other very intricate physiological things that we have no idea. And, and so the doctors, thinking in their head, what else is going on? And it, it's just, it's a very complex situation. I think the next is what family needs. <clears throat> nope, it's what physicians need. They need patients who trust them. And if you, if you don't trust your doctor, you need to go get a different one. And that's different than doctor shopping. And you know, you need somebody, <laughs> Doctors need the patient who gives accurate information. The I feel awful is, and my eyes hurt all the time, is different than I'm only sleeping two hours a night. I'm breathless when I walk up five steps. Music drops 20 times a day. My spouse says my eyes are not closing. They know what those are. I feel awful and my eyes hurt. Doesn't really tell them anything specific. And they need, that information can only come from us. Next. Families need, <clears throat> they need accurate information. Families need support. Families need patience and we can try it to the total limit. Families need communication from the patient with the patient. Go with the person to their, to their appointment. You can help them remember what is said. You can ask questions, you can gain understanding. Somewhere else, it asks about what to do about the, the, graves, the graves outbreaks. And I'll put it in here. One is to sit your family down and talk to them when you're fairly, you know, when your levels are fairly calm. Say, y'all, I am, I'm so upset that I do this. I don't do it on purpose. Please just come give me a hug. You know, whatever to help me just settle down. It'll get better. But if you haven't told them that, they think you're just being a real witch. And they don't know why. Because then you quit doing it in your fights. We make it hard on the families. And the family tends to just back off. Okay. What's next? Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dr. Patterson. This is a pre recorded program, and we sent out a survey prior to recording to ask what questions you have on this topic. And so we'll cover a few of those next. Um, but before we jump into uh, the QA, a note that we got a lot of questions about COVID 19, since that is top of mind uh, for many of the members of our patient community. Um, so in the description to this video, um, which is airing on YouTube, we'll provide links to an excellent FAQ from the American Thyroid Association, also to a GDATF webinar on COVID-19 um, from last April, and a new webinar that was actually on the long-term use of antithyroid drugs, um, but that also touched on some common questions related to COVID-19 uh, and the COVID-19 vaccine. So um, look for those resources in the description to this video. So our first question for Dr. Aruda, how can we make sure that new patients get correctly diagnosed with Graves' disease at the beginning instead of going through the whole gamut of medical, uh, mental health diagnoses like depression or anxiety disorder or panic disorder? Um, I think they can be... Um, two things. I think that they can be informed. And so um, webcasts such as this and information uh, that's been disseminated by this foundation and also other, other institutions, I think is extremely valuable, you know, knowing what the symptom prevalence is. But on the other side, I think it's very important to be uh, looking at the physician and uh, interviewing the physician, uh, primary care physician, uh, for example, 
you know, does he or she have any sort of understanding or do they emphasize human behavior? Because, you know, getting back to some of the somatic versus neuropsychiatric symptoms uh, that Nancy was talking about a moment ago, in some ways, the overlap between them or the separation, the orthogonal separation of those two categories uh, is, is inaccurate. Um, because you saw, for example, the nervous system, uh, the brain as somatic. Well, that's also underlying a lot of these symptoms because changes in the brain manifest as changes in how we feel internally and also how, how we behave. So having a physician that has a, an appreciation uh, for the behavioral side, whether they be a neurologist, whether they be an endocrinologist, whether they be a psychiatrist, it's very important because sometimes uh, physicians can be very traditionally trained, may not have as much interest in behavior. Uh, and I think that can lead to problems. Okay, thank you. Dr. Patterson, uh, anything that you have to add? The question was, how do you get a good diagnosis? Correct. Okay. You can, when you get a, a referral, call the office, ask to speak to the office manager and say, how many Graves patients does Dr. Robertson see? If they say, oh, a couple of months, that's probably not who you need to go see. You can call the Grace, you can call the GADTF and ask us to help you find somebody. We have a, a, a list on the website of doctors that have said, you know, I'll be glad to be someone you call. We can direct you to the ATA. You know, we, we'll do anything we can to help, help you get to a good doctor. And some of these four standard deviation patients, I've learned a new term in the last year, and it's basically, they're a university level patient, not the, not the local clinic patient. And those doctors work as a team. And, and my experience has been some doctors, if you ask for a second opinion, they go, absolutely. That's the kind of doctor you want. If, if they go, what do you want a second opinion for? That's a real sign that you probably do need a second opinion. And the other thing is university level doctors will get back with your primary care, whether it's primary care or endocrinologist, whatever, and they'll work together. They're not gonna swipe the patient and keep them, but you may be having to travel a little bit more to, to get to them you can get good workups and good information and then go from there. So those would be my suggestions. Ask how many patients they see, how many Graves patients they see. And if, if you have to go to a university, go. Most of them take you without, you know, tons and tons of referrals. That's what they're there for. Okay. Patterson, and I will... Um, I'll also note that we will add in the description um, some links to the American Thyroid Association, the ATA that uh, Dr. Benson referenced, uh, also the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, uh, and the Hormone, uh, the Hormone Health Network, um, and we'll um, provide links to all of those in the description. So for Dr. Patterson, are there natural cures or supplements that can provide relief? I'm smiling. <laughs> there are none that have evidence. And I think I saw on some of the statistics from Dr. Ruda that people might have a, a three or 4% success rate. What I'm always afraid of is that people will take them and delay proper diagnosis. And Graves' disease takes a tremendous toll on your body, on your brain, on your heart on your bones, and if you're just putting it off and putting it off. I, I know that there's several that are mentioned quite frequently on the internet and things, but there's not, honest to goodness, research on them. And whatever you take, talk to your doctor about it. Just, you know, what other, what other medications does it interfere? 
does it interact with, some of them interfere, some of them enhance. But don't just go off on your own and, and go to the health food store and pick up bottle after bottle. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Patterson. And I think maybe part of what makes these so-called natural cures attractive to people is they look at the three conventional options um, and there are risks to any of those options, whether it's, you know, antithyroid drugs or radioactive iodine or surgery. And, you know, there's kind of this process, the thought process that says, okay, I'm going to try something natural instead that's not going to have any um, risks to it. But, you know, perhaps, you know, they do, first of all, they do have risks. And second of all, perhaps the biggest risk is that they just won't work. Um, and that, as you noted, um, you know, the Graves disease will progress and continue to, to take a toll on the body. Um, yeah. So, and again, I would stress that um, if there are any supplements that you're taking or thinking about taking, um, make sure your doctor knows about that um, first, because there can be interactions with medications and some, um, some supplements can be toxic in large doses. So just make sure your doctor is um, in the loop on that. Um, so for Dr. Aruda, if I have a new symptom or complaint, how do I know if it's my graves causing the problem? It's a very good question. Um, I guess what I would suggest is, um, given that we found uh, the endorsement of symptom prevalence to be what it is, which is mood disorders, including major depression, uh, generalized anxiety, uh, social anxiety, that if somebody's presenting with those symptoms, um, that that would be enough of a cause, especially if there's no history of it within the family uh, or, or with the individual, that having the thyroid levels, the levels of thyroid hormone looked at would be very, very appropriate, um, even, even when done by uh, a primary care physician, um, because it could be at that stage that it's identified and treated uh, right away. And depending upon how complex the case is, it may have to be pushed up to a, a specialist. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dr. Patterson, do you have anything to add? I don't think so. And I, I think sometimes there's a tendency when we do have Graves, you get a new symptom and the assumption is, okay, this is my, you know, this is my Graves disease, but it may in fact be something completely separate that needs a, a separate <laughs> diagnosis. So it's, it's really critical um, to work with your doctor to make sure you get the, the root cause so that you can get proper treatment. It's um, um, for Dr. I, if I could just oh, add, go ahead. Yeah, if I could just yeah. add this, it, it is very difficult. Uh, and so differential diagnoses associated with many of these symptoms uh, that we've been talking about can be difficult because there are a variety of causes that, that can result in, in these symptoms. So that's kind of why it's really important that not only the patient, but the physician uh, really know or really understand uh, what the prevalence rates are, for example, uh, not just symptoms, but prevalence rates for different disorders so that they can better help uh, patients. It's really important to see a physician, but it's really important for the physician to be open-minded and to be well-trained and to be aware of prevalence rates, patterns of symptoms. Um, so anyway, yeah, I mean, it, it is difficult. It, it's just inherent in the type of symptoms. Okay. When, Thank you. When I was going through these questions and writing things down, one of the things I wrote at this question was, we don't know, and we have an expression with the foundation is WAND, W-A-N-D, we are not doctors. We, could, we need to go explain it to the doctor who is a doctor, and then do the things that Dr. Aruda was just talking about, the, you know, looking at the prevalence of what it might be and where it might come from. Okay. But we're kind of bad about making decisions on, on our own. <laughs> Yes, I am. All right, thank you. Um, for Dr. Patterson, does the ability to concentrate get better when your thyroid levels are stabilized? And she's laughing. Um, I think Madison addressed that in her very beginning, and that's what Dr. Stern told me bef before this was done, that Cognitive functioning was reported to be below pre-hyperthyroid levels even after participants returned to the euthyroid state. And after so many years, I don't think we have any 
you know, am I as cognitively alert as I was before I had grades? I'm also 30 years older, but I think we can make lots of, I'm not sure adjustments is the right word, but we, there are a lot of things we can do. One of my favorites for years, and this was before the onset of the internet and smartphones that can wash your windows on your car, is to keep literally a notebook. Everything gets written in that notebook and it gets written plainly. You do things like, oh, and, and sticky notes have become our enemy. We lose them. So you write somebody's phone number down, but you learn that you also write their name down so that you know who that phone number belongs to. I have lots of phone numbers and I don't know who they are but have some place to record it that you can go back to when something is taken care of. Don't scribble it out. You know, just make a little mark on the edge so you know it's been done, but you might need to go back to that. Um, and I learned something in graduate school. The word, the words, don't forget are recorded in two different parts of your brain. So you hear don't, or you hear forget. So you're gonna forget it. The word remember goes in one place. And I, my mother was, was really sweet. She got to the point that she would say, remember to pay the bills, instead of don't forget to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, and Dr. Ruta probably knows what that comes from. I knew at one time. But remember and write it down and hang in there. And I, I think one tip I heard you um, share several years ago was not to use acronyms because when you go back to that notebook, oh. um, if it's a weird acronym, you <laughs> might not remember what it stood for. So, um, so right. write it out when you can. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and certainly it can, yeah, certainly it can take some trial and error. Um, you know, to kind of find those life hacks that will, that will work for you. You know, maybe I'm a write it down person, um, you know, for somebody else that might be, um, you know, keeping that on their, their computer or their phone. So just kind of some trial and error to figure out um, what works for you. Um, Dr. Aruda, do you have anything to add to that question? Oh, and you're on mute. I thought, no, I don't. Um, I thought okay. Nancy handled that very well. Okay, excellent. Um, so a question for Dr. Da, what can I do to get a good night's sleep? And I'll, I'll preface that question with the importance of getting thyroid function tests done, because if, um, if you're hyperthyroid, um, insomnia is, is very common. So, so let's say this is somebody that, that has normal thyroid function tests and is still struggling um, with sleep issues. Uh, what are your suggestions? Well, assuming somebody's uh, hyperthyroidism, Graves' disease is being managed appropriately in the euthyroid, uh, really it's good sleep hygiene, the same thing that it would be for anybody else. And so, you know, going to bed at, at a regular, uh, on a regular schedule, getting up on a regular schedule, uh, not exercising late at night, not eating late at night, um, getting exercise, but exercise during the day uh, when the sleep-wake cycle uh, says it's appropriate to do that sort of thing. And so I, I you know, basically maintaining a very good sleep-wake cycle um, is, is important. And, but also eating correctly. I think, um, and this isn't specific to uh, Graves' disease, but I'm talking about with good sleep hygiene pertains to just about everyone. We all, we all know about this. Um, uh, eating well, getting exercise, having a regular um, sort of schedule for being asleep and, and being awake. Uh, there are some things that will always be out of our control. Um, it happens to me, it'll happen to you. Um, so if, you know, for example, um, the management of the disorder itself. Well, it's not going to, we'll, we're never going to manage it the way the thyroid would manage it if the immune system were doing uh, its job. Um, and, and so that might always be a little bit of a, a problem despite what we do, but we focus on things that we can control. Um, 
And then there, there are other sorts of things that people find very useful. For example, white noise at night, or maybe even, you know, kind of instead of just abruptly going to sleep, having some sort of stepping down of the day where you might uh, engage in behaviors that are kind of relaxing uh, a little bit more pleasant uh, before actually trying to fall asleep. So no um, scrolling through your social media at uh, 10 p.m. for you. Uh, yeah, I think one of the things, you know, and, and it's interesting because, you know, there, there, there is some reason to believe um, that human beings have what's called a second sleep. And this has been something that was documented, you know, hundreds of years ago where it, it may be quite natural for somebody to wake up during the middle of the night, having the kind of the first part of the sleep and then the second part of the sleep. Uh, I would just caution against doing things, should one get up, doing things that would result in different arousal systems in the brain kicking into gear. Uh, everything from high level cortical stuff like anxiety, thinking about the job and thinking about due dates and things like that, uh, to um, you know exposure to very bright lights, which tends to reset uh, the circadian rhythm. Um, it helps us to maintain our sleep-wake cycle here on Earth. Um, so yeah, I think, I think should one wake up, I think trying to get back to sleep would be the thing to do. Adding anything in would, would just interfere. Okay, thank you. Dr. Patterson, do you have anything to add? I have two things to add. One is there were lots of studies a long time ago on sensory deprivation. I personally sleep with a sleep mask to keep my eyes from getting dry and I have earplugs right there and I put them in and there's just nothing to keep me awake. But there's also nothing wrong with asking your doctor to give you something, mm -hmm. you know, so they know what they're doing and they know what you're doing because sleep is extremely important and decent rest because it just, the, the lack of it builds up the wrong way. But, uh, you know, and I would rather do that than go to the drugstore and go, okay, which one of these can I get a, get a, a real one so the doctor knows what's going on. But I love your okay. Yeah, I'd like to add something to what Nancy has, has just said. You know, some of the research we, we have currently on sleep is, has been very, very promising. Uh, things that we just didn't know. For example, when somebody sleeps, the brain uh, cells within the brain naturally shrink and, and allow the flushing of the brain to occur so that byproducts, abnormal proteins, you know, we hear a lot about amyloid beta protein, these abnormal amyloid beta proteins, tau proteins, these are things that really need to be washed out of the brain to remain healthy and sleep provides that for us. So um, this would be true for anybody, but certainly somebody who, who may be struggling with uh, Graves' disease, getting, getting the appropriate amount of sleep, which can be different between people, uh, but getting the appropriate amount of sleep is, it, it, it isn't just a matter of kind of replenishing uh, resources or conserving energy. It seems to play a major role in fl the flushing of the brain and keeping that tissue within the brain healthy. Okay, thank you. So a, a question for Dr. Patterson that you touched on during your presentation. Uh, how can you deal with rage, which can be so destructive to relationships? And, you know, we, we have, I think you mentioned the phrase Graves rage, and that's not a technical medical term. But if you say <laughs> that to anyone that's a Graves patient, they know exactly what you're talking about. Oh, yeah. um, so do, do you have anything to, to add to that? Uh, I think I, what I have to add, to, first of all, it's very real. It's very embarrassing and you feel completely out of control and you pretty much know what you're doing, but there's no off key. I've mentioned talk, talk to your family because that's usually where you're doing it is like with your spouse or with your, just with your family. When things are calmer, sit down and talk to them and say, I do not mean to do this. My levels, two things. My husband and I used to have very strong discussions. We weren't really arguing, but we were pretty close. 
and he would say, have you had your levels checked? And this was early on, and I'd go, no. But I'd go right on the calendar, what we were talking about. And I'll go get them checked, and then we're coming back to this. Mm -hmm. Not one time did I ever go back to whatever we were discussing. Mm -hmm. Never. And that was just an agreement we made that if, in, in, when I was being calm, you know, if, if you think I need to go get my levels checked, tell me because I don't necessarily always see it and he was right every single time <laughs> and but but I think trying to explain it to your family it's another good reason to, to be going to them going to the doctor for them to say yeah this happens and we're trying to get her levels down and the other thing that I wrote down when I was writing all this was apologize at least acknowledge that you know I really made a fool of myself last night and I am so sorry and sometimes we don't like to apologize so get over it <laughs> and apologize <laughs> all right thank you so this next question we kind of veered off into this when we uh, were answering a, a previous question um, it was, how can I find a doctor who is knowledgeable about Graves' disease? Um, so Dr. Aruda or Dr. Patterson, do you have anything to add um, to that that wasn't mentioned before? Nancy, did you want to? I don't, I mean, it's hard to find one. And you just got to keep trying. And and we've, we've talked about some, some avenues to, you know, where to call, where to, where to look questions to ask, and just don't give up. And sometimes a, a doctor will actually say, you know, I need to help you find a doctor that knows more about this than I do. Okay, thank you. Dr. Arruda. Back to you. Yeah, I think the only thing I would say, I, I, I really would just reiterate some of the points we've made. I think looking for um, an endocrinologist with a behavioral sort of interest or, or some mm -hmm. training. Yeah. Uh, somebody who specializes in the thyroid is really somebody that should be uh, looked for. Um, I think I think it would save um, a lot of heartache, time, money uh, if one were to put the effort in up front to find the appropriate individual with those sorts of characteristics. Okay, thank you. And as we start to wrap up, I, I have a question for, for Madison. Um, so I know that you're currently a research associate um, and you're in the process of applying for medical school. Um, and I'm curious whether the findings here are showing that there can be lingering effects for some patients with no easy solutions um, have affected your perspective as a future physician. Yeah, so I think it's really eye-opening to the realities of the patient-physician relationship and the fact that the physician is not always able to provide a cure for the patient. And also in the fact that medicine is not black and white and there are the overlap of, the overlap of symptoms that we have seen here in this study. Um, but even when that is the case, you know, the patient, or excuse me, the physician is still able to hear that patient and their suffering and manage their symptoms on a daily basis as best as possible. And then I think from a scientific standpoint, it is you know, motivating to see the areas where progress still needs to be made and the work that needs to be done. Um, we've made a lot of advancements within the medical field, within the, within the scientific field in curing diseases and providing medications that help patients. Um, but there is, you know, work that needs to be done, especially in Graves' disease. And so with that, you know, you can only hope that in the future we'll continue to make new discoveries and new advancements that will be able to help patients. Okay, thank you, Madison. And that's a, a perfect lead into our last question. Um, as I noted at the beginning, this program didn't set out to solve the puzzle of these neuropsychiatric complaints, um, but rather to raise awareness of, of, an, of an important issue. So what do you think the next step should be um, from patient, for patient groups like the GDATF and also the medical community um, to help new patients get a quicker diagnosis and also to help those who are struggling now find some symptom relief? 
Is that towards me or is it? <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll go to both of you. So whoever whoever okay. wants to kick it off. I um, I I think being informed uh, really is probably the best solution uh, going forward, um, and that's one of the reasons why we have this webinar and why. Uh, the Graves Disease and Thyroid Foundation has so much outreach. Um, uh, I, I don't know that there is any sort of um, any sort of um, exchange or or anything. <laughs> Sorry about this. I'm trying to find the word. I I don't think there's anything that can be done that would serve us better than just continuing to. Uh, try to get the message out, to try to get people to understand uh, that there are these behavioral, uh, also internal experiences that go along with changes in hormones, changes in brain physiology that are very, very real uh, and need to be treated because it ultimately affects how we, how we function and how we perform. So I, I think just continuing what we're doing uh, what the Graves Disease and Thyroid Foundation is doing. And, and I think physicians as well as uh, patients need to be perhaps better informed about the symptoms, um, about not just Graves disease and its symptoms, but I would even say um, the symptoms associated with other changes that may occur uh, within the nervous system that if, if, a, if a clinician or a patient were better informed, understood the relationship between brain uh, and behavior, I think uh, we would probably see uh, quicker diagnoses, more accurate diagnoses. And it isn't just Graves disease. There are a lot of other sorts of disorders that are, that are kind of, that are similar and that they present um, with such uh, symptoms. And so just being educated, uh, being aware, I think would go a long way. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ruda. Dr. Patterson, do you have anything to add? My addition to that would be something that we did one time several years ago is develop some continuing education for physicians because they have to have CMEs all the time that really address these needs. And I mean, of course, I'd like to go to medical school and give a lecture, but that's not going to happen. <laughs> but I, but I, I think that doing continuing, medi continuing medical education is a way that we can reach into another, another avenue to reach the physicians. Because if we can help them understand, they can help us understand. And we're doing it. We're doing it for patients, like like this webinar. But we need to, we need to do things for physicians that they will be enticed to participate in. So that's where the, the CMEs come in. You know, they need them. We can help you get them. Listen to us, please. All right. Thank you, Dr. Patterson. Um, I'd like to thank all of our presenters, Madison McInnes, Dr. James Arruda, and Dr. Nancy Horde patterson for an excellent program, the County mm -hmm. of San Diego for providing funding for this program, Paul from Boz Advisors for the technical assist, and to you for watching. To learn about future GDATF programs, please reach out to us. Uh, our contact information um, is on the slide. It's also in the video description on YouTube. Uh, you can visit our website at gdatf.org, visit us on Twitter or Facebook at, at GDATF, call us toll-free in the USA and Canada at 877-643-3123, or email us at info at gdatf.org. Thanks and have a great day.